Hi there folks, welcome to Finometrica's first webinar for 2017. I'm your host Craig Saunders. Soon we're going to be joined by your presenter today, Paul Resnick. Paul is going to be our guide to the risk and return guides which are used by financial advisors to frame and manage their clients' investment expectations. Paul will explain how that works and he'll demonstrate some of the conversations that you can get kick-started by using those guides. But before we get into that nitty gritty, let's look at our objectives for this session and we'll look at some background on the Finometrica Risk Profiling Toolkit, particularly for those of you out there who are meeting it today for the very first time. First, what is a risk and return guide? Well, imagine a portfolio, it can be any mix of assets. Using historical data about the asset's performance, we can construct a guide to the risk and return experiences that any particular portfolio has given to investors in the past. Essentially, the guide shines a spotlight on volatility and performance, and it shows how these matched or differed from the investor's expectations. The point is to determine if a portfolio is a suitable investment for a client. These guides allow the historic volatility of the potential investment to be compared with the investor's risk tolerance. Any mismatch is a warning sign and becomes the basis for further discussions about risk and return trade-offs between the advisor and their clients. So, to our objectives for today. We're going to explain each of the sections in the Risk and Return Guide because there are nine unique sections and different parts tell us different things. Because our time's limited, we'll only be taking a bird's eye view, but don't worry, more webinars are coming soon that will explore some of these key sections in a lot more detail. We'll demonstrate how advisors can use these guides to kickstart conversations with clients about risk and returns so that you can frame and manage their expectations about their investments and we'll briefly illustrate some of the more complex information that these guides can highlight for you. We think you'll be quite surprised by what you can learn from some of this data. The Risk and Return Guides and Risk Tolerance Test come from Finometrica, a world-leading provider of investment suitability tools, including the Risk Profiling Toolkit. Finometrica has been in the market longer than just about any of its competitors. It was founded more than 20 years ago in Australia. Since then, more than 1 million risk tolerance tests have been completed in more than 20 countries around the globe, including the United States and United Kingdom. Today, Finometrica's Risk Profiling Toolkit is one of the most scientifically robust and legally defensible risk tolerance processes available. Now, Finometrica offer a 30-day trial for you to test out the entire Finometrica Toolkit for free. You can even call us for support as you work your way through the system. There's no obligation and no credit card needed to sign on for that trial. Just go to riskprofiling.com and choose the Advisor Trial button on the front page. The Finometrica Risk Tolerance Test has been created using psychometrics. Think of it as a cross between psychology and statistics. By comparing how someone answers the questions against a large population's answers, you can unlock information about them. The Finometrica test is available in two versions, 25 questions and 12 questions. The 12 question version is more focused and suits automated processes like robo-advice. The 25 question version creates a rich pool of data to help advisors help their client by starting and guiding conversations about risk and returns. Now here's a taste of some of the questions. How easily do you adapt when things go wrong financially? Have you ever poured money into a risky investment, mainly for the thrill? What degree of risk have you taken in the past, and what degree of risk are you prepared to take now? How far could your investments fall before you begin to feel uncomfortable? Which mix of high, medium and low risk investments do you prefer? How much do you expect your investments to earn over the next 10 years compared with certificates of deposit, called term deposits, in the UK and Australia? Then, using the answers to the 25 questions, the computers go to work on those complex statistics. They turn the answers into a numeric score out of 100. That number puts the person into one of seven risk groups that emerge out of the risk tolerance bell curve. Now, as you can see, risk tolerance perfectly shapes to the classic bell curve. Men do score a little higher and women a little lower, but as a total population, the most number of people are around the middle. There are group 4 on this bell curve, with scores between 45 and 54. To the right, we see higher risk score people. In group 5, the scores are up into the 55 to 64 range, but only 24% of people fit into this group, compared to 38% in group 4. 
Further to the right, Group 6 are big risk takers. Their scores are 65 to 74, but they're only 6% of people. Then in Group 7, the scores are extraordinarily high, over 75, but only 1% of people will ever score that high. To the left, Group 3 is more conservative and cautious than the norm of Group 4. Group 3 scores are between 35 and 44, and 24% of people fit into this group. Further left, Group 2 are very conservative indeed. They have scores of 25 to 34, but only represent 6% of the population. Then, at the extreme, there are the extraordinarily conservative, with scores of less than 25, but they're only 1% of the population. Looking at this bell curve, you can start to conceptualise asset allocation overlaying onto it like this. The people in the middle, that's risk group 4, are your average risk takers, so they get an average portfolio. Let's call that 50% growth assets and 50% defensive assets. Way out on the right, the groups 6 and 7 get high risk portfolios, with 70 to 100% growth assets. While out on the left, groups 1 and 2 get ultra-conservative portfolios, 70 to 100% defensive assets. And the groups in between the middle and the extremes will get a portfolio between those two points, like a 60-40 or 70-30 split. This is how you go from a risk score to an asset allocation, a process that Finometrica calls mapping and which is really important. Now to allow everyone to get what they need, or what they want, the seven risk groups require 11 portfolios of different ratios between growth and defensive assets. The portfolios go from very conservative, with absolutely no growth assets at all, up to high growth, with 100% growth assets. There's a portfolio for each 10% increment, so that's 10, 90, 20, 80, 70, 30, 60, 40, and so on. We'll talk more about later what's inside these portfolios and where the data comes from, but for now, let's just keep it simple with these broad headings of growth versus defensive. So, each one of these 11 portfolios has its own risk and return guide. This means an advisor always has the resource available for every client, no matter how risk-seeking or conservative that client may be. The risk and return guides are within the Finometrica dashboard for advisors. As you put the client through the system, you can clearly see where they fall on the curve, what risk group they're in, and the appropriate asset allocations, including signals for where there's too much or too little risk. Go to the advisor trial page at riskprofiling.com and you'll be able to see all of this for yourself during that 30-day free trial. But all of the risk and return guides for all of the portfolios are also freely available from our website. You don't even need to give an email address or credit card number. Go to riskprofiling.com and look for the menu across the top of the page. At the far right, click on Resources and FAQs. Then click on the first item in the list called Risk Profiling System Resources. Now, from the list, choose Risk and Return Guide. These guides are produced for the key markets where Finometrica is used to allow them to be personalised to the local market experience. So there's guides for the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, India and a few others that you can see on your screen now. So choose your country. Today we'll work with the guides for the United States from our 25 question test. So clicking on that PDF we see it open and this is the risk and return guide. In this first table, we see that there are those 11 portfolios from very conservative through to high growth. Today, we'll look at portfolio 6. That's a balanced portfolio with 50% growth assets and 50% defensive assets. Now, within this report, there are nine different sections and each is rich with stories that will help you frame and manage your client's expectations. And we'll work through each one of those, so in a moment, we'll bring back our presenter, Paul Resnick, to explain it all to us. On the line today, we have two people from Finometrica. The first is Paul Resnick. Uh, we'll get to him in one moment. The second is Tyler Nunnally. We'll just let, let, let the system catch up, and they both should be joining us soon. Tyler is our US strategist. Tyler is the go-to person for anyone in the United States dealing with Finometrica for any questions or follow-ups. Tyler, how are you? Good. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. So, so as I mentioned, yep, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut over the top of you. As I mentioned, you're the person in the states to go to. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm based in Atlanta, so East Coast time. If you ever have any questions, I've been working with Finometrica for about five years now, so very well versed in the science of risk tolerance as well as the functionality of the risk profiling platform. So if you do ever do have any questions, I'm here for you. My number is four zero four. 
3206047. That's an Atlanta number. Uh, don't worry about writing it down now. We're going to introduce, or at the end of this, we'll send out an email that have all the contact details. So, uh, once again, happy to help. Terrific. Thank you, Tyler, for being with us. And Paul Resnick, I can see you up on my screen now. Paul, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Craig. Now, for those of you who don't know Paul, he's a director and co-founder of Finometrica. Paul, let's just talk for a minute about the data that's underpinning that information that we just that we just looked at. I'm going to bring up that slide there. Talk to me for a moment about the asset allocations that we're seeing here. All of the work that we're going to talk about today, where has that data come from? What's the source of it? What we did uh, originally was talk to advisors to look at or ask them for their opinions of the local versus international exposures, the home country bias, and then we've gone back to the original indexes. The longest ones we could find were in the early 70s. So we provide a generic overview of how portfolios would have behaved in the 11 risk groups. Essentially, they are the accumulation matrices for each of these uh, subgroups. You can see across the headings there, cash bonds, US stocks, and foreign stocks using uh, easily available accumulation indexes, rebalancing once a year. So we're using an idealized form of, uh, of, of history before fees, before any taxes, to show the relative performance of portfolios that we can compare back to uh, individual risk scores. Now, you're pretty proud of these risk and return guides. Why do you think they're so important? I think that most uh, most communications in the financial services industry have, have been around uh, asset class performance uh, and not reflected on what clients actually uh, actually receive. So we we provide a, a background a framework for people to see how portfolios would have behaved, and they're much more realistic. Um, individuals get to spend whatever's left after the money has been invested for good or bad. And the way we have displayed it, we explain both the best and the worst and the average against both nominal and real and against the way people have answered individual questions. So it enables a level of intimacy between uh, what is otherwise quite abstract and the client. It brings the two together. And what we're talking about here is framing, setting people up for what they should expect so that they don't get a nasty shock and sell out of their portfolio. Um, essentially, everything we've learned over the last 20 years is that surprises disturb people. And if you're not surprised, if you know it's going to happen, um, there is a long history that we have a correction every 10 years. It can make a real mess of a portfolio. And of course, the issue around portfolios is they're a, make, they're a makeup of different asset classes. Not everything drops at the same time. Not everything booms at the same time. Not everything recovers at the same time. And we focus on, amongst other things, the, the experience on that portfolio, not just the day it starts crack, um, coming down, but the time it starts recovering and how long it takes to recover to its original position. Let's look through this report at some of these aspects. The first, we're just talking about investor expectations, and here we have a very, very good measure of it. But first, I want to look down into this table here um, because this is something that comes up a bit. We have this certificates of deposit 10-year returns, historical and recent. The recent reflects the low interest, low return era that we're living in. The historical is the longer term view. They're, they're, they're quite different pieces of data. Um, what, what happens is we tend to remember the most recent news. Um, particularly on this question where we're asking people for their upside expectations, they tend to remember the current um, low CD rates. Um, in each country, we look at this, this can be quite a large gap, and if you look carefully, you can see that the average over the last 40 years is almost, is over double what it's been over the last short while. And uh, um, it, it's important for people to understand that what they remember isn't actually um, a basis for, uh, for framing expectations. So we try to do both, provide a longer term perspective and a more current one. 
I've just drawn a circle around this bit, which I think is important. What, what this is telling us is that risk group four people, which are dead in the center, they expect that over 10 years they'll earn two to 2.5 2 times the CD return. And next to that, we see here what's their downside come for most 20%, but for some 33%. 2 to 2.5 times CDs, that's a fairly ambitious earnings target, isn't it? Well, historically it's been fairly, uh, fairly ambitious, but more recently, because the interest rates have been much lower, then people can, can be a little, uh, um, a, a little likely to believe that the returns will be better. The framing against that question, wherever we talk to people around the world, is, well, surely we should be able to get two or three times or even four times the, uh, the CD rate, this is much lower. And of course, what we're, what we're trying to do is put things into context, not just the last memories or the most recent experiences that uh, the clients have had. And so I've just changed the slide so we see returns now, actual versus expectations. And here, here's the rub. It only made twice 41% of the time, 2.5%, um, 2% of the time, expectations and reality don't align from the get-go? It seems not. Um, what we've discovered is, this, this is risk group, four, risk group four, which is the average uh, of the community of uh, clients of, uh, of advisors. Um, as you can see, um, that distribution is suggesting that there's quite a broad range. Um, while it's 1.72, uh, 1.73, times the CD rate over the last 40 years. There have been periods where people have got particularly poor performance compared to the CDs and uh, periods when it's been particularly high. Um, the, the issue to remember here that this is a reflection of how um, our, our investors think. We spent four years developing these questions and this framing question was a very difficult one. Um, when we talked with people, um, we discovered that they really didn't understand inflation. They weren't terribly numerate. And this was the best answer of several questions we tested to frame upside expectations. That doesn't mean everybody believed it or, uh, or understood it. It is but the best of all the questions we tested. Now, this one's interesting, the volatility. Basically, what's this, what this is telling us is that if people throw their investments in a drawer and don't look at them, they'll see a lot less volatility. Hardly a surprise, really. Um, it, it goes back to what, one of the great truths. The more often you look, the more miserable you'll be. There will be many more negative processes. And uh, as we can see, if you look on the left-hand side here, on this 50-50 portfolio, the, the first pie chart, you'll see that uh, you'll see the portfolio dropping a third of the time. If you actually looked, and we go over to the right, yearly, it will have halved. Um, so that's a natural framing. Most... Uh, most of us um, compare things to another number, and the number that we last uh, looked at might well be the number we are comparing to. So in this case, if you looked um, less often, you'd, you'd actually get much better upside expectations delivered, and you'd diminish the downside. So we encourage people to, uh, particularly for those that have uh, a low risk tolerance, not to look on a daily, weekly, or even monthly basis but to look longer. And if you do need to talk with your clients, it's to talk about the other issues in the planning process, not the portfolio, when you have that opportunity. Now, this one's pretty interesting, rises and falls. You can spend a whole afternoon on this page, and I think you and I have before. Um, it's telling us how big the rises were, how long they took to happen, how big the falls were, how long they took to happen. I would think this would be a very serious reality check for a lot of clients if you sat down, showed them these tables, and talked them through it. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot that goes on in this, uh, and just to cover a couple of them, if we just look to that top right uh, um, um, table, we're looking at the rises at the portfolio level. Um, you can see that most of the rises are relatively short. If, when we're talking about, if we're talking about encouraging people to, uh, to market time, you can see that uh, if you've waited to see that the market is about to move, you could well miss it. Uh, most of those uh, those rises at a portfolio level have been uh, have been less than 12 months. Now remember here we, we've got a very unusual circumstance. We've had 40 years with diminishing interest rates, 
Um, so we've, we've, we've been getting a dividend on, on longer maturity bonds. That no longer prevails and there might be greater volatility going forward, but for, for the moment this gives us our greatest indication of how quickly the market moves. If we look down to the, uh, the bottom right box, the, the, this, is, uh, this is the downside expectation framing and uh, you can see that these are the 10 biggest falls over the last 40 years. Even with a 50-50 portfolio in October 07, the market dropped over 25%. It took 16 months to, to drop and 19 months to recover. Um, now, th th this is really designed to make sure that people are not surprised. The worst thing that you can have an investor turn around and say, you gave me a portfolio and I didn't know how bad it was going to be and I'm feeling pretty sick. Um, what we can see there is a pattern that the large falls have taken a fair while to keep coming down. The three largest ones, 16 months, 14 months and 25 months. And the recoveries have been quite varied, 19 months, 7 months and 14 months. So when we have a major correction, it, 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 it takes a fair while to get to the bottom and sometimes quite a long time to get to the top. Is this a warning sign here? If people have said that their downside comfort is 20%, this portfolio is capable of delivering them a loss of 26 and a half. This is a very good warning. So what we've got is um, from the, uh, the test, we've got a straight indication of what people say. And of course we do couples, and it's highly likely that one in the couple will be less risk tolerant than the other. Um, and we've got a, a due warning. If the client has said a 20% drop, we can say there will be a 20, another 25% drop. It's highly likely. There's one here every, if we look here, there's some major corrections um, every 10 years over the last 40 odd years. It's going to happen again. When was the last one, give or take, 10 years ago? Um, there's likely to be another one coming along shortly. It's going to be quite heavy, quite hairy. It'll take a while to come down, but what we want to encourage you to do is not be scared. Selling out at the bottom or on the way down and looking to buy back in on the way up looks to be a very quick way of losing money in the longer term. Now I've switched this over to the historical returns slide. Some very interesting stuff here when you compare the nominal returns to the real returns. I think we could all agree that most people out there in the street don't really understand inflation and its impact on money. In these tables you can very easily show people exactly what happens. So what we've done is we start at the very top, we, we, we've just looked at the nominal, the, the, the way things would have been reported if you'd invested in a portfolio investing in the, in the indexes rebalancing once a year. And if we take the, 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 on that table, if we look to the right, the middle number, um, if we take the 10 year period and assume that's, that's a reasonable long term holding position for a portfolio, it would have returned 9.9% on average. Um, for some people, it was over. It was close to 16% for the very top. Uh, the white swans, if you will, the black swans earned in that last uh, proportion 1.9%. Uh, um, uh, um, that, that's that. They're quite confronting numbers. Um, of course, these are nominal. That they don't take into account purchasing power. So that second box looks at giving. Uh, giving advisors a tool to, to talk with clients about the, the consequences of inflation. So on the left hand side we've got uh, four inflation rates, one, three, five and seven percent. And over ten years at five percent um, the the value of a hundred dollars diminishes to sixty one. Um, now as we talked earlier, we go to the third box about say the consequences of recent memory is that we forget things. So once again, if we look at history, we can see the average inflation over the last 40 years has been 4%, but actually over the last 10 years it's been 2%, it's actually half. So that fourth box, what we're trying to do is, is apply those sets of numbers all together. So what we can see is that over the last 40 odd years, the average return, if we look to the right there in this fourth box, after inflation has been 5.8%. Now, if we allow for fees and taxes of anything between one to three percent, that five percent drops to two, three, three and a bit percent. We're talking about uh, 
essentially a diversified portfolio historically protecting people from inflation and giving them a marginal return. There's nothing in this to give you any reason for great optimism that somebody's going to get very wealthy in a diversified portfolio. Having said that, that that is the average. Some people actually made much better, 50% made better than 5%, but we're always concerned to make sure there's a way of framing the downside. And as you can see there, that uh, on the two standard deviation, a poor performance actually was 0.2. After fees and taxes, people would have lost purchasing power. We do the same again in that bottom box for the more recent 10-year period. And once again, you can see the numbers there suggesting that uh, it's close to 3% um, um, real return before fees and taxes. In this example that um, we're about to roll to, um, we can actually look at it in, um, in dollar terms. Yeah, let's do that now. I'll take us through the, to that end values page. I just flicked around a few slides there. Sorry, folks. So, yeah, here, here we see it. This, is, this would be more meaningful for people, I think, if you put money in now, this is what comes out at the end. So you can say that in purchasing power, if we get the average return of the last 40 years, your $1,000 may have got close to doubling if that, uh, if that happens again in the future. But there's a likelihood that you may actually lose purchasing power. Um, over the most recent period, um, the, the, the last 10 years, the, uh, the return has been much lower but the volatility has been less. So if we look at the right-hand side there, we can see that uh, um, it's 1.3 times is the, uh, the purchasing power over the last while, but uh, the downside isn't quite so bad. So this, these, these numbers are often very confronting. And the reason is, I guess, twofold. At an individual level, we tend to frame things around the news that we've heard. We don't talk about portfolios in the media, we talk about underlying asset classes. And so we remember the noise about those movements, the currency movement, um, interest rate movements, not how they all fit together over time. And uh, this is also quite confronting to advisors because often um, there's been, uh, they've been trained to talk about the upside expectation, the performance that uh, that portfolios will deliver. Uh, and clearly what the history shows is that um, the numbers have been quite conservative. And it's not that the US numbers are particularly different from any other country in which we work. Um, we, we do look at uh, across the board as we showed at the beginning, um, we've got numbers going back uh, 40 years and half a dozen countries. And the patterns are really quite consistent. I've just flicked across to the next slide on savings plans. What this is showing us is that same sort of information, but for somebody making regular contributions, whereas the previous data we just looked at, that was for a lump sum that was invested and let to run. So we won't spend any more time on that savings plans page. I wanted to get to this one, the variability page. This one um, has a very big difference between the historical data that we see over here, these average Average returns, 24% 23% of the time, 8% 23% of the time. Now, nothing above 4% on the way. It's just a wasteland, 6, 8, 10, 12. This must be a very important doc document to help frame people's expectations to say, look, if you're expecting 6, 8, 10%, it just isn't there to be had. Well, it's certainly not been there, there to be had. And of course, once again, this is counter to the noise that we've heard. We've all been told that this has been a particularly volatile period over the last, uh, um, essentially since the um, since 2000 and the tech wreck, compared to earlier periods. But as you can see, the range of returns is both is is much shorter um, on the right hand side, and the actual return is 3.1 percent on average versus 5.8. Um, so much of this data. When, when advisors and clients look at it, um, they feel quite uncomfortable because it's inconsistent with the way they've seen the numbers done before. We're always trying to take the client's perspective. We started off by assessing their risk tolerance. We've linked across to a portfolio that's consistent with it, consistent with their answers. And then we're able to frame what, what's happened against what they've told, told us about themselves. 
And the critical issue, as I said earlier, we don't want people to be surprised. The markets crash, the markets boom. If you're invested consistently outside your risk tolerance, you're more likely to be emotionally caught up in both the drops and the rises, and you can destroy as much value as buying in as the market rises as you can by selling out as the market corrects. So we mustn't, uh, mustn't discount the, the disclosure of the, the upside that's so visible in, the, uh, just, in those numbers. I've just popped up the slide called the investment experience. This is really, really interesting. Taking a 10-year period, depending on when you invested, the blue line was a 1976 investor, the red line is a 1986 investor, the purple a 2006 investor, very, very different experiences depending on what area you were invested through. Um, it is a, this is a dynamic report that we do each year. We just simply go back 10 years from the time that we do the, uh, we redo the tables and the previous three 10-year periods. Um, and what this one shows is that 87, that the 86 um, period, if you'd invested just before the market crash, everybody would tell you, the worst thing that can happen is for you to invest fully before a market crash. You will be punished. But as you can see, the three others, the, the, the three other commencements, give a considerably lower return. Um, we do this each, as I said, um, every year. So over a couple of years, it can change because clearly um, crashes and, uh, and market booms drop out. But it clearly shows that it's market timing can have a huge impact upon that end benefits and uh, this mixture of the four is invariably a good story to share with people that, that everybody's made money in the longer term but you could be lucky and it could be an absolute uh, a better return and it can happen even if you if you think uh, and, and believe the historical view that you don't need to be fully invested. Um, here we see that the 87 crash, one of the major crashes of the last 40 years, has, um, has recovered quite quickly and that portfolio has gone on to deliver better returns. Now Paul, how do advisors use all this information that we've just gone through? These nine sections, a lot of, a lot of them have multiple stories within them. Is it actually sitting down face to face and going, look, this is what you've told me and based on what you've told me you need to know this. Um, in order to sign on for what you're doing. Is that, is that the me me mechanism that people use these for? Um, well, I certainly wouldn't be using all nine of them. I, I think uh, um, you and I and some of our uh, um, people listening today might find this interesting. Um, I think you need to find the ones that are relevant to, to a client and uh, um, most advisors will, will have something they're comfortable with talking about, the ravages of inflation, the, the uncertainty of market timing. Um, so you choose the ones that, um, that best suit that client's needs and that you're most comfortable talking with. Um, clearly you wouldn't use the ones um, if, you, if you believe that, that giving um, clients information on a really regular basis about their portfolio, you wouldn't use the pie charts to show that they're going to have bad experiences. As we know, prospect theory tells us that clients treat rises and losses differently. Um, some people need as much as five times a dollar rise to compensate for a one dollar loss. If you say to somebody, look regularly, you're setting them up to have a fairly miserable experience. So um, I think it's horses for courses as we describe it. You, you, you will have a ch had a chance to talk with clients, you'll know what you're interested in. But the nice part about these is they copy beautifully onto an iPad and very easy to attach. You don't need to put the full report, you can actually take through. What we've tried to do and we've, what we've looked at today is we've looked at some of the numbers and we've looked at some of the graphics but there's also a narrative in most of them. And so if your client has a preferred learning style or you have a preferred way of communicating, you can take from that. I certainly wouldn't suggest you need to go beyond two at the initial phase. The critical issue is you don't want clients that are surprised and you do want clients to stay with you in the longer term and what, what, what the report provides is a framework for those discussions and as you know we've always argued that while risk tolerance doesn't vary over time, it's worth talking with people about their risk tolerance quite regularly and retesting it even though they sh you shouldn't be surprised that 
it's unlikely to have changed, there's always a different story and you can always tie that story into local news that comes from the risk and return guides. And of course, sometimes you just want that piece of data where, oh, if only I could show them the biggest fall, or if only I could show them what their money is going to look like in 10 years if they don't take a more aggressive profile, and a lot of that data is here in these reports. Yes, the, the good part about this is it's comparable. One of the things that we learned very early talking with advisors is that you really don't want to surprise clients early on. It's a 40-year journey. They don't need to be fully exposed to equities, um, particularly if they have a higher risk tolerance in the first year. But yes, there might be a timing risk, but there's also the risk that they lose confidence in the market and you because they're not fully prepared. And one of my most successful clients in, through, 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 the, uh, through the 80s and 90s deliberately de-risk portfolios for clients in the early couple of years so that they can build rapport and confidence so that at no point could the client turn around and look and say they've lost considerable amounts of money in the early periods and then they increase the equity exposure over time to bring it closer to achieving the client's goals. Okay, Paul, well, we've come up in our time constraints as we always do. Thanks very much for that. I'm going to switch you off now and just wrap up for the folks. Thanks, Craig, and thanks for listening, everybody. Okay, folks. Now, before we go, I just wanted to tell you about some other publications from Finometrica that might interest you. If you don't know about it, we put out a podcast every fortnight. It's called Financial Planning Conversations. The latest episode was on an audit of investment suitability in a number of companies in the UK. Very interesting what was found in that. Now, I've just popped up the iTunes store listing for the podcast. You can subscribe to it there and all those episodes will be shunted to you directly. Or you can check it out on the riskprofiling.com website slash podcast. All of the episodes are there. Now, while also on the website, we recently put out a book called Robo 3.0, The Rise of the Enterprise Solutions, and a case study on a 3.0 Robo Advisor, which is really, really pretty neat. And you can have a free copy of that. Go to this page, fill in your details, and that will be sent out to you. Now, more webinars coming up for you, first and third Wednesdays of each month. We're going to try and keep them fairly tight, around 30 minutes. We've got a couple of minutes over today, so please forgive us for that. Very much trying to give you an insight into how Finometrica can help you help your clients and get better results for everyone. And remember, that 30-day free trial of Finometrica, it's the whole system. Nothing gets held back. You can use everything that's in there. Just go along to the website, sign up, and it's all yours. And folks, that brings us to the end for today. We are done. Thank you very much for your company. Thank you for being with us. We'll send you a follow-up email after this. You'll be able to watch the webinar again down the track as well. Meanwhile, if you have any questions or queries, please don't hesitate to get in touch through the riskprofiling.com website. So on behalf of everyone at Finometrica, thanks very much for being with us today. We look forward to your company again soon. I'm Craig Saunders. Bye for now. <laughs>